I, I would add one other thing to, my, uh, to the comment David made about my IBM career. It was uh, wonderful. I don't know how I got there. I tricked them into hiring me. Uh, and, and I did spend the last two years there in the, in the PC world. Uh, learned about Compaq at a national meeting in New York City, which I was kind of embarrassed since they were right here in Houston. But the next thing I did at this Tektron was really a computer land franchise, and then I became a Compaq dealer. Now, I never had a dog in the fight between IBM and Compaq, but I had a real good seat to watch it, and it's, it was incredible. It was incredible. Good. This is not the first time I've interviewed Rod Canyon. He is uh, my, probably my favorite guest, was the first guest on the show. Favorite because I still think uh, not enough people, not our city, needs to, has ever recognized what he achieved. I've always envisioned a huge bar chart in downtown Houston <laughs> with his first year sales on it. Uh, this is gonna be a live recording, live audience, obvious. Uh, you're welcome to be as live as you want. Uh, we, we're okay with clapping and laughter, hissing and boos. We hope we, hope we don't. <laughs> Goes with the territory. <clears throat> All right, so uh, here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Business Maker Show, brought to you by Comcast Business, built for business. Special because we're in front of a live audience at the Hilton Hotel at the University of Houston. And it is another cool MIT Enterprise Forum event, also brought to you by Comcast Business. And it is my great pleasure to have as my guest here, the co-founder and CEO of the most successful startup in business history, producing more first-year revenue than eBay, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook combined. Please join me in welcoming Rod Canyon. Okay, lots of discussion about that startup, 111 million, fastest company to get to a billion dollars in sales. How in the world did you do that? Oh, it was easy. <laughs> okay, next question. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as I was writing the book that just came out last October and, and putting together, you know, some of the details of it, it's the first time I really realized why we went after $100 million in our first year. When you really think about it, that was a stupid thing to do. I mean, a startup that just finishes developing a product, has no manufacturing, why in the world would you try to ramp up your manufacturing that fast? Well, there's an answer, and it actually kind of makes sense. We had put this idea together, which was to build a, a portable computer. What we were looking for was something that wasn't being done at the time in, in, in computers, and there was a whole lot of computer companies, so. There wasn't much that wasn't being done, but the idea was a, a portable computer, rugged, nicely styled, that would work in an office and, and meet the needs of the market at the time. The one big problem we had was how are we gonna possibly get software? And that's when the idea finally gelled in my head uh, on January the 8th. One of the things that's burned into my brain, you know, that I'll always remember was the chill running down my spine what if we could make our portable run IBM PC software? Then it would always have the most important, the newest software available for it. It was a simple idea, could it be done? So we charged off down the path, hired a team, raised some money, hired a team, built the, uh, the prototypes, continued on down the path, and then we got ready to go sell the product. You, know, you can build the greatest mousetrap ever, but if you don't have a way to sell it, it was all for naught. Well, fortunately, there were these computer stores that were really becoming the main way computers were sold at the time. And IBM had entered the market, and so IBM and Apple were in all of these stores, and they were doing quite well. So it was natural that we would go to the computer stores and show them our product. And so let me give you an example of, of, of how that worked. Brace yourself. I just happened to have... <laughs> I just happened to have one of these. A portable. <laughs> Trust me, it's a portable. Well, okay, maybe it's transportable. Okay, this, this has been called a lot of names. One of which is, it looks like a portable sewing machine, but 
we designed this, the feet in the bottom so that we could set it on the table. And I'd go into a dealer and I would set it down on his table and I would lean it over like that. And then the keyboard stamps on the front, has feet on it like that. I would unstamp the keyboard and I'd say, we have a computer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought too, but the, dealer, the dealers didn't really think that much of it. They said, well, it's kind of nice. And, you know, so we'd go on and we'd tell them how great it was. It was rugged and you know, how many megahertz it had and how many kilobytes of RAM and all that. And they would be, okay. And then we'd get to the, the end and we would say, okay, well now, this really does run all the IBM software, so you can go pick any, any program you want off the shelf. Let's take it out of the shrink wrap so this hadn't been staged and plug it in. So they would go skeptically, pick, a, pick the one they thought probably wouldn't run, take it out of the box, come plug it in. And when it came up and ran just like it did on the IBM PC, their eyes got really big. I mean, their eyes got big and you can see the wheels turning. And then the next thing out of their mouth was, how soon can I get 20 of these? How soon can I get 25 of these? It was, the number varied, but the, the reaction was the same. Now, that was a nice thing to hear because it meant they liked our product, and of course it was like our baby, but more importantly it turned out was we were hearing something from them. They weren't really saying exactly what it was, and that is there is a pent-up demand for a product like this. So we've been thinking of it as a cool portable computer that had access to IBM software. What they saw it as was a portable version of the IBM PC. And people had been asking for a portable version of the IBM PC. So sure enough, there was this pinup demand that, hey, we discovered it, but nobody else knew about it. So now we had this opportunity, if we could capitalize on it, to really go capture a big piece of the market very quickly. So after after going through a lot of dealers and getting the same reaction, we went back to Houston, back to our office, and did the calculations, and we were blown away. When you just simply multiply it out, you know, five units per month per dealer times 2,000 dealers, you know, we can do $100 million this year. Wow, are we going to do that? Well, okay, we were pretty conservative, so our first reaction was, nah. Let's, let's, let's build this nice, we can, we can ramp faster than what we got in the plan, but let's don't take any real risk. But then as we began to do in those days, we began to really think more about it. Okay, so what's the repercussion of that? And, and, and it wasn't quite as simple as it first seemed because here's an opportunity. We can actually go get in, we believe, almost if not all of these IBM dealers, and they will try to sell our product. But if we can't meet their demand, if we can't supply the computers, what are they going to do? Well, we're going to create more demand and then they're going to go sell somebody else's because sure enough, there are going to be a lot of people that follow us. So if we want to capture the demand and then hold on to the dealers that we get in, we're going to have to ramp up really fast. So we really thought it through. We decided on the, the fastest ramp we thought we could manage. We had to change our plans completely. We had to go out and raise 20 million more dollars. We'd already raised $10 million in two different tranches. But in February of 1983, we, we raised an additional $20 million to fund the ramp for that year. And uh, the other thing I guess it's worth pointing out is we were afraid to actually tell the investors we were trying for $100 million. We thought they would laugh. So we said 80. We said, okay, we think we can do 80 if we're really lucky and maybe it'll be less or, or more, but we're gonna go for 80. And you know, the good news is we missed the forecast, but we hit $111 million instead. So anyway, that's, that's how we hit $100 million is the opportunity was really there. It was really clear. And uh, we decided to go for it. Sounds pretty easy, actually. It was. <laughs> no, I mean, when you put all that in perspective and look at the number of people that you hired, uh, the number of assembly lines you had to build, and then you had to build computers, you had to ship them, and you had to have people accept them and pay for them. I mean, that's just an extraordinary uh, execution endeavor. Did, was it stressful there? Where, was everybody worked to death? Everybody on the team worked very hard. But we found out something about people in that first uh, couple of years, and that is, 
if you create an environment where people are working together <clears throat> and not sort of fighting each other, and they're not trying to look better than the other guy, if they understand where you're trying to lead the company, what the game plan is, what our, what our model is, you know, we em emphasize quality. We're not going to ship anything that doesn't have the highest quality we can possibly build into it. You get everybody on the same page and then get them to work together to that end, it really becomes a, a different kind of place to work. People would come to work and they couldn't wait to get there. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I still run into uh, at a sporting event or at a mall. I don't remember them. They come up and shake my hand and say, you know, I couldn't wait to get to work in the morning when I work for Compaq. Thank you for starting Compaq or whatever. But the point is, it was a great experience for the employees, even though they were working very hard. And so that's how we were really, we, we, were, we were fortunate enough to attract really competent people because you start with a, a good core of, of, uh, of expertise in, in all the different fields, and then it tends to attract good people there. But then you create an environment where they work together. They become very efficient, very effective, and so we were able to, to pull it off. Well, I, I think I've told you this before, but I witnessed that. I was invited out to the assembly lines one time, must have been in 1987, 88, 89, maybe 90, I don't know. They've all melted together now, mm -hmm. but as a, uh, as a leader of one of your dealerships and uh, to just tell them what it's like to be a dealer and to be selling their product. And as I talked to them, and they were like 500 people in the room, all from, from assembly lines, and they were all really intently paying attention to me, but I, I sort of felt this thing that you're talking about, about how much they enjoyed working there. And it actually, I'd, I'd experienced this one other time in my career, it was at IBM, and it seemed like everybody's self-esteem went up about 25% when they went to work there. And, and it's just an incredible feat for the culture, and the culture, I, I felt it all the way through, and it was just Very incredible. Yeah. All right, so, that still doesn't explain 111 million in my opinion, but we'll, we'll take it. Uh, I think a key part of it too though, that you've already talked about was the strategy, which was your idea. You always talk about feeling like an electrical boat when you, <laughs> you as you thought about a portable computer that was compatible with IBM. And if there's some young people in, audi in the audience, which uh, I, I see there are, they might not understand this, but in the beginning of the PC world, there were, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 manufacturers. And every one of them used a different version of DOS and therefore had different versions of all the software. So it was real complicated. You couldn't just go in a store, pick out the hardware and then pick out the software. It, and software versions didn't stay up to date. That puts into more perspective what the original strategy accomplished he chose what was suddenly the most popular PC after 1981, after IBM introduced it, to follow that path. And quite frankly, it wasn't easy to make software compatible to it. Explain that, the reverse engineering thing. So we have this idea, we're gonna make our portable run IBM PC software. And we make some assumptions. First of all, we know that IBM's PC runs product they get from Microsoft. It's called PC-DOS. And it's basically the same as this other product called MS-DOS, which they sell to all the other companies. And each company then goes and adapts it to their different computers because they're all different. We also know that IBM has a BIOS-ROM, which is highly protected. It's, it's copyrighted. So we have to figure out a way to legally go in and reverse engineer the, copyright, the copyrighted uh, ROM. And so we do that but what we didn't know at the time, we could actually go to put the plan together, we raise money, we close the initial investment. And then I have a meeting with Bill Gates, he, uh, you know, this, this young kid. Uh, we're out in San Francisco at a computer fair. And I, I, I calculated when you told that story the first time, he was 27 years old at the time. I can't believe he was that old, but maybe he, he was. Maybe. Yeah, he probably was. <laughs> but they looked like kids. He and Steve Jobs both looked like yeah. kids. And, uh, because I was older. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. So I explained to Bill, look, Bill, we've started the company based on the idea that we could get a, a version from you 
of MS-DOS that's actually compatible with IBM's because we found out that the one you sell everybody else is totally incompatible. It won't run any of the IBM software. Can you do that? Can you sell us a version that runs all the IBM software? And he doesn't know the answer to that. He thinks about it. He thinks it's a good idea. But he's got to go back and check. So he goes back the next week and he checks with his people and a couple of weeks go by. And finally we get the answer, uh, no we can't. We don't have it and we can't build it. The reason they couldn't was obvious because while it started off as, an, as a Microsoft product, IBM had modified it greatly over the, the time and it belonged to IBM. The only way Microsoft could create a version that actually was compatible was to go reverse engineer it. Well, it's one thing if you're compact trying to reverse engineer it, but if you're, you know, you're, you're Microsoft and IBM is your biggest customer, there's just no way you can you know, throw that relationship out the window. So there was, that couldn't happen. So what we figured out while we're down the road a couple of months is, oh no, we've got to go figure out how to take the incompatible version and make it compatible. That was almost a stopper. That was so hard that it, it would have been easy to, to just say, oh, we'll go do something else. But we were committed to it, and we weren't about to, to turn back, so we, we hired several more software people and went down the, the path of discovering each and every incompatibility between MS-DOS and PC-DOS, figuring out how to make it compatible and making that change. And so we did that starting about uh, sometime in March, March or April, and uh, of 82, and then did it all the way through till the beginning of the next year. And we gradually built up people, a bigger and bigger team, because it was so hard, it just, we didn't make much progress at first. And then, finally we got the process going and we began to find them and fix them. Several hundred changes had to be made to MS-DOS to make it run all the software. Now, as it turned out, we, we were the only company that committed. Others got into it and they were sort of compatible, or more or less compatible. But we were the only company that ran all the software. And where we discovered that is when we went to our first show, Comdex, in November of 82, in Las Vegas, there, there must be 50 companies announcing compatible computers. Well, we ended up getting this award called Best in Show. And the reason we did was because we're the only company that ran all the software. Everybody knew IBM compatibility was going to be a big deal but there was only one company that really had taken it all the way and ran all the software. So that was sort of the launch of a, of a reputation. It took a lot more pieces to, to build it along the way, but that was the beginning of it. And, and this is huge, this was huge. The, the example that Rod talked about when he took the portable in, put software in it, IBM software, and it ran. I mean, from a dealer's perspective, it, it, was, it was just you know a godsend because I mean, it, it completely changed the amount of inventory that you had to carry and so forth, made it really good. Rod, though, was real popular amongst all the dealers. You know, uh, IBM was, was still kind of waffling in whether or not they were loyal to the dealer network or going to sell direct. Rod and his team discovered uh, that weakness along the way and uh, became extremely loyal to the dealer network. I tell this, I've told this story in front of him before. I don't think he likes me to tell it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, it was in, there was a huge Computerland conference. This probably was in... 87 in Vancouver, and uh, the highlight of the day, this particular day, was a presentation from the IBM vice president on the PC and what it was going to be like for the future, followed by Rod Canyon. And uh, boy, there was, a, there was a lot of hostility in the audience uh, when the IBM guy spoke, and, uh, but he finished, and he's walking out this huge hotel room, and Rod Canyon is announced, and the place erupts into a standing ovation that kept going until the IBM guy was even out of the door. I mean, it, it was emotional. It, it, was, it was really was uh, incredible. So anyway, back to this strategy, yep. portable yep. And, and totally compatible. You took that compatibility to a point where eventually you were more compatible with IBM than IBM was. So, so let's talk about what happened there. It started out as a very simple idea. We're going to be able to run IBM PC software. Well, that was when IBM had one product, the PC, and we had one product, the portable. But as the technology advanced, as you know, it, it does more rapidly all the time, faster and faster processors. As 
The next generation processor came out. Originally it was the 8088 in the IBM PC. The 8286 from Intel was in the next generation PC, which was uh, the IBM AT. Well, it wasn't quite compatible. For some reason, IBM didn't see the need to make the new AT run all the old software. But we had learned how to make a computer run old soft, existing software, and so when we came out with our 286 product, it ran all the old software. And that was really the beginning of an industry standard, because IBM saw it as just different computers that were faster and faster, but we saw it as a way to really create a, a very big customer benefit, which is you buy all the software and you learn how to operate a computer, and you learn how to operate the software on that computer, and then when you upgrade to the next generation, you don't have to throw it all away and start over. You can actually take all of that with you. And it's not only the software, by the way, the, the plug-in cards that you would call uh, you know, uh, peripherals now, uh, all the same of those worked on our machine and IBM's machine. And then when you upgraded to the next machine, ours ran all the old cards. IBM didn't run all the old cards. It was a little bit at first, but it began to, to build. And so what Compaq began to create was an industry standard. It was based on the IBM architecture, but it was Compaq really making this backward compatibility work. And then, and then something happened that really solidified it, and that was we became worried about how different our MS-DOS was from what we were getting from Microsoft, because there would be a new version of MS-DOS every six months or a year. And every time they came out with a new one, we had to go make all of these changes to the new one. So it was a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of resources and time. We came up with the idea, why don't we license our version back to Microsoft? Because they clearly wanted to be able to sell a compatible version of MS-DOS. So we, we did. We licensed secretly our version back to Microsoft, and they began selling it to all of our competitors, except IBM. <laughs> IBM could have used it. I mean, they could have had access to it, but that, that's not the way they work. So at that point in time, now we were still the most compatible because things were always changing and we were always staying out in front. But now all of the other computer makers, PC makers that ran IBM software had a very high degree of compatibility. And so now customers really had the confidence that if I want to switch from a Compaq to a Dell or to a HP, I can do it and, and the software will run. So it was a, it was a safety factor for the customers. It really made uh, freedom of choice much larger. And it, by the way, because one of the ways you could compete was on price, it actually put uh, lower pricing pressure on all of the makers to be able to continue to bring prices down to where they were more affordable. See, this thing, when it first sold, was $3,000 with one floppy. You can imagine now you can go out and buy this amazing notebook computer for you know, three, four, five hundred dollars. So that's not just the way it happened. It's a result of the industry standard creating a level playing field where people have to compete on either better features and technology or lower price. And so there was some of both, and that over time led to where we are today. Okay, so uh, in this period of time, really late 85, 86, I was definitely computer land, a dealer of Compaq and IBM and Apple. Uh, and the company that bought my company was real pro IBM, so we kept having all these strategy sessions with them. And it was interesting. It was obvious that there was a battle brewing big time, but it was always talked about as a battle between IBM and Microsoft. Somehow or another, uh, Rod and Compaq wasn't talked about that much, but suddenly this kind of discussion and rumor started that IBM's finally had enough, and they're going to do something about it. And so gradually things started leaking out, which was very un-IBM. They used to not do that at all. Uh, and along came a, a proprietary system, a proprietary software, PS2, micro-channel architecture. And uh, you guys did pay attention to that. And uh, it was an interesting time in your company. IBM made a very bold move that everybody believed was going to work. I mean, it was brilliant if you looked at it from their perspective. They had created the industry leadership position. They had all of these companies, literally, you, you said 20 or 30. At one time, it was 200. It, it grows and shrinks, but, you know, maybe it was 50 at that time. But 
all of these companies trying to follow them around, making computers that run the same software. So basically it was IBM, you know, the Pied Piper and, and all of the others, except for Compaq who understood how to do these things, so we actually got out in front of IBM. And that, that's part of what built our reputation as an independent technology leader. But IBM decides they've had enough of this, and so they're gonna come out with a very proprietary, very protected computer and they're going to license it to all of these followers for 5% of their sales. So they kind of see that there's some benefit in having a bunch of other companies out there, but they don't want them to get the money. They want to take money that they feel like, you know, this really should be theirs because it's their ar architecture, right? And if we had all followed them, they were right. It was their architecture. That was, it should have worked. It, it, as it came into the market, it was heralded by the press and by the analysts, by the major companies, as this is the next big thing. They began to buy them in the millions. Uh, worse than that, all of our competitors began to buy licenses and build compatible machines. So by, by the end of 1987, nine months after IBM enters the market with the PS2, literally all of our competitors, HP, Dell, Radio Shack, all, all of them have licensed it and are bringing or are already in market with a, a PS2 compatible machine. It's all but over with. Before we finally decide we just can't go that path, we have to do something to stop it. Now IBM didn't have the ability to, I didn't realize this until I wrote the book, the reason they didn't make their new machine backward compatible with the old architecture is they didn't know how to do that. They had never had to do that. They just brought out the next machine. So they were bringing out an advanced architecture. It was IBM's name on it. They could sell it. They could sell, you know, ice to an Eskimo. So they, uh, they, they were confident they could sell it. And they were selling millions of them. But we understood that it was really a big customer benefit to maintain this backward compatibility. So we used our technology, which it turns out we were the only company that had it, to be able to build an advanced architecture, and since we had theirs as a, as a model, we could make ours a little better than theirs, but also be backward compatible. So we came up with a design to do that, but the problem there is they're IBM and we're Compaq, and it's a marketing game, and we're not gonna win that battle. If we say we're better and IBM says they're better, you know, we'll sell some computers, but IBM's gonna win the battle. How are we gonna get our better architecture, which has these advances, these features that IBM doesn't have, to be accepted by everybody. And the way we decided is, we're gonna take this most valuable technology that we own, and we're gonna give it away to all our competitors. Well, is that really a smart thing to do? I mean, you know. Uh, well, yeah, and the reason is because we've got one shot at this. If we're gonna stop IBM, they're already way down the path. If we're gonna keep them from literally taking over the market, the only way we can do that is we put every advantage we have into this better architecture, convince all of the other computer companies to join up with us and commit to building computers based on it and not on the uh, PS2 architecture. Then at least we have a chance of shifting the momentum away from IBM and, and back to the industry standard. So once we decide we're gonna do that, we commit the whole company to it. We go first to Microsoft, Bill Gates, he's scared to death of IBM. He, they're, they're actually not just coming after the clones, they're coming after uh, Microsoft and Intel. So we go to Bill Gates, he says, yeah, we'll help you. We go to Intel, they said, yeah, we'll help you. So we go to HP, because they're the other uh, strongest brand besides IBM, and they join forces with us. It, it took a couple of months to get them on board because I mean, it is one of those things that's too good to be true, right? Here's this great technology that's better than IBM, you don't have to pay a royalty in. You're giving it to me free, okay, well. But we finally convinced them, and, and it made sense. This, if, we, if we can stop IBM with this, then it's worth it for us. They join forces. Then we go after, long story short, by the day of announcement, we have 80 companies have signed up. Literally all the other computer companies have signed up to support this new extended industry standard architecture instead of IBM's PS2. And the day we announced it, it was the first time I ever remember the major business press actually giving us the positive coverage and IBM the negative. That is saying, this looks like it'll work, 
IBM has a problem here. And sure enough, it did. It broke their momentum. Uh, a year later, when we came out with the first products that used the uh, ESA, Extended Industry Standard Architecture, they were so powerful and so fast, blew away all of the IBM stuff, including some of their mini computers, as far as performance goes. Uh, it really broke the back of, of this new uh, move by IBM. And it was about five, uh, four or five years later that they ended up taking it off the market. And it's about the same time that Compaq passed IBM and became, and became the world leader. That is the incredible part of the story. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you really think about it, what, what, what he did is that he beat IBM. IBM essentially eventually got out of the business. But not only that, in reality, uh, there's nobody that played a better role in the growth of Microsoft after that time than Compaq and Intel as well. Uh, everybody sort of standardized, and I, I should let you describe this, but, uh, but, but the standardization is what made you know, the microcomputer industry take off, become lower cost, and, and everybody started buying one. Now, there's probably young people in the audience that they think about the globalization of the world today. They think, well, it's all about mobilization, that we have these little devices, and it is. But before that, they can think way back to when it was just about socialization and social media, and that's what it was all about. And some of them might even be uh, old enough to remember when the internet you know, <laughs> first became a player. Well, this is what happened before the internet. W without this, the internet would not have taken off because there wouldn't have been so many PCs out there. And, uh, and thank you for doing what you did so well. <laughs> well, you know, I used to tell people, you know, Compaq saved the world from IBM. And of course they would say, yeah, right. <laughs> but it was not until I finished writing the book and, and really sort of figured out a way to explain it that, that, that I realized, you know, in a way we really did because if IBM had succeeded, what would have happened is they would have decided when each new technology came out. They would have kept the prices from going down as fast. So when IBM wasn't in control anymore and the open industry standard was really clear that it was going to continue on, then everybody began to learn how to play on this level playing field. So if you wanted to be a player, you had two choices. You could either differentiate by better features, new technologies, which meant people, when they came up with an idea, they rushed to beat Compaq and other people to market with this new technology. So it, it sped up the rate of advance of technology. And at the same time, you could also get some market share by lowering your price. And so it really sped up the lowering of prices down the price curve. And when you unleash that over this next decade through the 90s, and then you fed it with this demand for internet access, then it really caused this explosion that led to the rapid advance of technology that led to the mobile devices we have today. I believe, and I think if anybody really studied it carefully, you would be able to prove that if it had slowed down at all during that period of time, that we wouldn't have had enough horsepower, enough technology to actually make the iPhone work when it came to market in 2007. And in fact, Steve Jobs said, he tried to get it out earlier, the technology wasn't there. As soon as they had the performance and the capabilities they need, they came out with an iPhone. And that was really the beginning of this, this next wave. In fact, the last chapter of the book is sort of explains how IBM went from almost out of business to really becoming the market leader in a very short time. And it was all based on the total surprise, them finding the next big thing and the, their competitors not seeing it coming. Incredible. Before I let you go, two more last questions. Uh, let's imagine we have a young entrepreneur in the audience. We very well might. What kind of just general advice would you give him or her? Oh, there's so much, uh, you know, to, to, that goes with success uh, starting a company. Uh, I don't like it when, uh, entrepreneurs don't like it when I tell them this, but uh, great ideas are a dime a dozen. In other words, a lot of creative people, a lot of really good ideas, and that'll get you nowhere unless you really do all the other things you have to do to make a successful business. Now, we had an advantage. When we started Compaq, we, we entered a market that was mostly kids. IBM obviously wasn't, and all the established companies, but a lot of the startups were, were young people. We had 
10, 15 years experience in, in, a, in a very good company that taught us how companies should work. And so one of the things I would tell an entrepreneur is, if you can stand it, go to work for a good company and learn how business operates. Because starting a company without that knowledge makes it much more likely you're going to make some mistakes. You know, if you can't wait, go ahead and try. But if you want to improve your odds of success, wait as long as you can and get, it, get some really good experience out there in as many different areas. In my own case, without even realizing it, I started out as a design engineer and then managed a design team and then I worked in sales support and then I worked in the factory helping uh, uh, build test equipment and then I worked in the, you know, solving problems as they came up in the factory. And, and you know, doing all of those things gave me this rounded background to be able to, then when I had the chance to start my own thing, to have some understanding of how each of the areas work. And that's really key. Great. Well, <clears throat> so the last question, hate to end on this, but tell us what you think of Halt and Catch Fire. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who, who haven't heard, Halt and Catch Fire is a, is a new TV program on AMC that's loosely based on the, uh, the computer industry as it grew up in the 1980s. Uh, some would say loosely based on Compaq, but it, it's, it's broader than that in the sense that they sort of took a, you know, the idea of a company copying IBM's uh, architecture to run their software. They miss it, they missed the whole point. Unfortunately, they hadn't read my book, so when they wrote the, the series, they, they didn't really get the gist of it. I mean, obviously our book would not make a very exciting TV series, but it would have been nice if it had been sort of close to the, uh, the real story. But anyway, it, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how well it does. It's really spicy, you know, it's got the, you know, the, uh, the intrigue and the sex and the, and the backstabbing and all of that that, <laughs> that make for good TV shows. Uh, Started but, off with an armadillo crossing the road. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we've got a few armadillos around. Yeah, that's right, that's right, <laughs> that's right. Well, Rod, I really appreciate you sharing your story, and I appreciate you doing what you've done. Well, thank you very much. Happy you to bet. do it. You bet. And that wraps up my interview with Rod Canyon, the uh, former co-founder and CEO of Compact Computer. And that wraps up this episode of The Business Maker Show, brought to you by Comcast Business, built for business.